highlight of this evening is to hear Paul Koob's and Todd Anderson speak, but I thought I would try and just set the stage a little bit as to why we're doing this. And the first thing I think you'll notice is it's an interesting location that we're doing this in. And we picked this location deliberately. We have, as you might imagine, lecture theaters all over the place where we typically give lectures to students. And this is an unusual place to do it. And we chose it for a couple of reasons. The first thing is right behind me is our statue of Hippocrates. Every one of our students, when they graduate, takes the Hippocratic Oath, and it's one of the things I like the most. I get to stand on stage with them at convocation and lead them through the Hippocratic Oath. And one of the sentiments in the Hippocratic Oath is that as physicians and as scientists, we have a responsibility, a duty, in fact, to both create knowledge and to impart knowledge to, our, to the public. That's what we're meant to do, and that's actually part of what we're doing tonight. And the second reason that this is a neat place to do this, and it's an experiment, but it's a neat place to do this, is this place where you're sitting right now is the center of the medical school. It's the epicenter. You're right at the heart of the medical school here. All around us are the places where we train medical students, the doctors of tomorrow. And perhaps more importantly, all around us are the labs in which science is done. So straight ahead of me over there are the, are the labs for inflammation. Behind the wall here, cardiovascular, neuroscience over to that side. All around us are laboratories. And science is not an eight to five job. Science is a 24 hour day job. So up in those labs all around us are graduate students working on experiments, looking at results, creating new knowledge. So I wanted to spend a minute and just talk a little bit about science and why we should all care, why science matters, because that's what we're about, and that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. So I thought a little bit about how we could do this, and I thought I'd give, just as an example, I wanna ask a couple of questions. Be interactive here. How many people here have heard of Einstein's theory of relativity? Hands up. That's pretty good, almost everybody's heard about Einstein's theory. So as part of Einstein's theory of relativity, there's a very interesting phenomenon that as an object speeds up, moves faster, approaches a measurable fraction of the speed of light, the time that you measure, a clock on the moving object, moves slower. So clocks on moving objects move slower than stationary objects. How many of you knew that? Okay, so a few, that's fantastic. Now the important question, how many of you think that knowing that is important for your day-to-day -day jobs in Calgary? Just about none. So final question, how many of you used a GPS to get here tonight or in the last week? So, interesting point. The GPS that you used is an interesting device. And the way it works is it triangulates between several GPS satellites. And the signal that it gets, the timing of that, is absolutely critical. There's an atomic clock on each of those GPS satellites, and it has to match the clock in your GPS to an accuracy of nanoseconds. The problem is, those satellites are moving compared to us. And in fact, they're moving at a measurable fraction of the speed of light. So for your GPS to work, your GPS has to calculate Einstein's theory of relativity and measure time dilation. You actually use that almost every day, even though we think it's something that's not important. So the second thing I want to just mention a little bit is relates to healthcare. So medicine has changed. I trained a couple of decades ago, maybe three decades ago. And every once in a while, they let me out of the dean's office. And so a couple of days ago, I was over at the Foothills Hospital seeing patients. And one of the things we do is we look inside patients with scopes. And we see inflammation. We see it all the time. It has changed dramatically from when I trained to what I do now. So the scopes, the materials that I use, are totally different with today than 30 years ago. But actually, that's not what impresses me the most. The thing that impresses me the most is we treat the same inflammation that I used to see 30 years ago as a trainee, but the drugs that I use now to treat inflammation are not only different than I used 30 years ago. I guess that would be expected. 
But the principle of those drugs, those drugs that we use today, are aimed at molecular targets that 30 years ago we didn't even know existed. So the whole premise of the drugs that we use has totally changed in 30 years. Science matters. So can I have the first slide? So science matters, and it's important to understand a little bit, there's going to be a quiz, how we, um, how we, how we invest in science. This is the world's worst slide. It's absolutely awful. We could use this as a demonstration for our teachers how not to make slides. And the reason that this is a terrible slide is this actually is a government budget. This is the UK budget. Each of these circles is a, is a government spending portion, and, and the size of the circle is how much the UK spends. And the reason I've chosen the UK for this example is unlike Canada, everything in the UK is centralized. So everything comes from the central government. It doesn't go out to provinces and federal things. So you can see the UK spends a lot of money on lots of different things. Every bit of science that has totally transformed the UK, all the funding for that science has come from this little circle right here, this little tiny one. It's less than 1% of the UK budget. And that's not just healthcare research. That's research into physics, astronomy, chemistry, research into the arts, research into healthcare. Every bit of research done in the UK comes from that one tiny place. In Canada, we're not much different. In fact, all developed countries do about the same. Less than 1% of the budget goes to science. This is Canada's federal 14, 15 federal budget. We spend just under $300 billion a year. This sliver, this tiny sliver, 80 cents out of every $100 that we spend goes to research. This funds all the investigator-initiated research through what is called tri-council funding. 80 cents out of every $100. And in fact, in 2010, it was 2.4 billion. And every year since then, it has either stayed the same or when it's red, that budget has in fact decreased. And so Paul and Todd are actually going to show you a little bit of what's important with this. We can turn the slides off. So the final thing I want to just point out and talk a bit about is that in Calgary, we're quite fortunate. You might be dissuaded from it in the papers at times, but we actually have quite a spectacular healthcare system in many different areas. We enjoy some of the best healthcare in North America, and we do it because, in fact, we've got a school of medicine here. That's a premise, but it's actually true, and in fact, I would put it to you that you already know that it's true. And the reason that you know it's true is, is illustrated by this example. So as a, as a GI person, we actually know people around the world. It's sort of an interesting group of people to chat with. One of my colleagues many years ago was a friend by the name of Nick LaRusso. And Nick, Nick LaRusso, in addition to being a gastroenterologist like me, was the CEO of the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And for 10 years, as he worked at the Mayo Clinic, he was interested in the people that went to the Mayo Clinic for healthcare. And one year, he did a very interesting survey. He looked at every patient that came to the Mayo Clinic for a year, and he asked them in a big survey, one of the questions, why did you come to the Mayo Clinic? All of the other places you could have come to, why did you come to the Mayo Clinic? And the answer to that question was quite illuminating. Two-thirds of the patients, just over 60%, said in one form or another, I came to the Mayo Clinic because my physician does research. Because the belief was that because they did research, they were at the top of, the, they were at the top of their game. They were the best. They were the ones going around the world talking about healthcare. And they're right, actually. If you think about all the places that are famous to go to research, if you want to go to the Cleveland Clinic, the Scripps Clinic, the MD Anderson, Memorial Sloan Kettering, every single one of those are research-intensive hospitals. We know that that's true, and in fact, you know that it's true. The interesting question to me is why? Why is it that at a research-intensive hospital, why is it that you get the best health care? And the simple answer, I think the one we often jump to, is actually wrong. The simple answer is, well, if you have great scientists there, they're making great discoveries, and they translate it into better health care. The problem with that is that research is a global business. Research happens around the world. So in, in Alberta, we've got 10% of the Canadian population, 1% or so of the North American population. 
how in the world are we going to create all of the best discoveries? We're not. So that's not the answer. The answer, though, is an interesting one. In order to get the best health care, you need to have people who have agile minds. You need bright people. You need engaged people. You need agile minds. Why we have the hashtag agile minds. And the neat thing about agile minds is they want to come to environments, to ecosystems that are stimulating. They want students around. They want researchers around. They want, they want what a medical school creates because there are other agile minds there. So we find it quite easy to recruit top quality physicians to Calgary or to Edmonton, but actually I can't recruit the same person to Red Deer. It's the same healthcare system, but it's not the right ecosystem.